I appreciate you coming out so early. I know this is the first session of the day, and you'd all probably rather be having your coffee or snacks. I see you have your coffee. Very good. Hi. Well, this session is about uh, building an international community for serious play as opposed to strictly serious games. And yes, there's a difference. My name is Matthew Lee, the chair of the IGDA series Game SIG, as well as a number of other things. I've been a game designer, I've worked on community stuff. I've been a registered nurse who, who's worked in the ER for a while, so if I seem rather calm and placid, that's probably why, because I've seen really outrageous stuff. And if it's not something that really gets the adrenaline going because someone's life is in danger, it's like, well, no, this too will pass. This too will pass. But really, what I've been doing in the last few years is working with the University of Pennsylvania with their game design, with their nursing and health schools to create a new program for design innovation in order to teach people the basics of design and of games. Because as you know, healthcare is one of those areas that is very interested in using games and other interactive technologies to better improve the way they treat patients, but most of the time they don't know if they don't know what they're doing in that area. And so they brought me in to help. Besides all that, I'm a PhD candidate studying communities. So keeps me busy. A lot of little hats here and there. One of the things I do uh, with the IGDA is I because I head up the IGD series game SIG have since uh, 2014, is I run the Serious Games Roundtable every year at GDC. It's one of the places where, it's one of the few places at GDC, the Game Developers Conference, where everyone can get together and actually talk about the work they do with serious games. No matter if they work in defense, education, healthcare, or any number of other things. And there's been a lot of interesting feedback from there over the years. People, people have uh, gotten introduced to IGDA, they've found that there's a community. They're really thankful that there is a round table because most of the time, for a lot of them, they feel isolated. They feel like there isn't like a big community for serious games. They feel like there are small little communities in various different places, sometimes local, sometimes around certain topics, but there's no one cohesive thing that brings them all together, as opposed to the game industry as a whole, where we can all call ourselves game developers, game designers. And we all have these big conferences that we all know of, this big unified culture. In short, people talk about how there was a lot of good discussion, how they are interested in joining like up with more groups. They, they, want, they like the fact that other people are talking about things they're talking about. It makes them feel like they're not so alone, which is really easy to, which is a problem that's really easy to get into when you're an indie dev or when you're like a serious game dev and you don't have that many other people who work in your field around you. And the bit, probably the strongest thing I saw was that someone actually said this was, that the round table was the source of some of their strongest connections out of GDC. That they wanted to be part of something bigger. And this, this is quite important because, well, relatedness, the, feel, the, the feeling that you are actually connected to other people and that what you do matters to them is one of the three uh, pr the three uh, primordial need, psychological needs of people, in addition to competence, the feeling that you know what the hell you're doing, and you feel like you're on top of that, and autonomy, the fact, the feeling that you're able to choose what it is that you're doing. Meaningful choice, in other words, as uh, comes up a lot in RPGs. Now, because I'm partially an academic, I feel like I should probably define a few terms before I go further. You've seen the terms of uh, a competence, autonomy, and relatedness, which is all part of a social determination theory, intrinsic motivation. But there's also stuff I draw from uh, social capital and social identity theory. We talk about bridging capital, which is how uh, this is how you interact with some of the people around you. Do you feel like you have some connections to them, and they can introduce you to new experiences and uh, new groups of people? There's bonding capital, which is how closely you feel connected to the poses around you. And then the social identity, the people and causes you associate with, as well as your status within these groups or associations. Like, do you have, do you have a particular thing you identify as? You, we all probably identify as people in the game industry here, for instance. But do we have little subgroups that we identify with? Do we have shared knowledge that we 
have with one another, and do we have things that are we consider central to our identities? And perhaps the last thing I'll be uh, talking a little bit about is social network theory. How many of you know about this? Okay. Uh, well, social network theory is, uh, it talks a little bit about information flow and how we're connected to one another. It talks about people in terms of ties, strong ties, weak ties, and absent and latent ties. Because people are basically like, and how they interact is basically like a network. Each person is one of these little nodes, and the strong ties between them are ties that are constantly being reinforced. When you have friends you talk to every day, colleagues you're in the same office with, you collaborate on the same team with, you get to know each other pretty well. You share a lot of information between one another. There's a lot, yeah, you understand each other quite well at that point. Your weak ties are your acquaintances, the people you see every once in a while, maybe game developers you only run into at GDC or one of the other conferences and you share stories every once in a while. You find out how things are going. You can learn insights from them. You can see how things are from a different perspective. And then, of course, you have the absent ties, which are the people you don't really interact with and you don't really know. These, thanks to technology, can become latent ties, which are ties that are just waiting to become weak ties because, hey, now, you can act now someone in America can actually talk to someone in, say, Minsk because of the internet and because of online communities. These are really exciting things and they make, and it's really latent and weak ties in this modern age that we rely on for information transfer. Because if you were just working with strong ties, you pretty much already know what your friends are thinking, you pretty much already know what your colleagues are thinking, and you don't really have any fresh perspective. Does that make sense? So yeah, what does this have to do with serious games, right? Uh, there's a lot because one, serious games is a bit of a loaded term. The people disagree on what it means. And then there's also a lot of stigma associated with the term because people think that serious games are automatically not fun, which is not true. I mean, there are a number of serious games that are not fun, but that's not intrinsic to the definition. For the purposes of this talk, we'll just say that they're uh, games which are designed for a primary purpose other than entertainment. I know other people use different definitions, but this is the one I'm running with right now because it's probably the broadest and most inclusive and hey, in when we're trying to build community, inclusivity does matter. Well, to go back a little bit to the, let's go back a little bit to uh, game development as a whole. Well, we know that when we talk about the values of games and people most, most, when we talk about the values of games, most people think about them as fun, entertaining, but that's just one of the many values that's been around since the, the rise of our industry, like maybe 30, almost 40 years ago at this point. It's what well, has long been understood to be the core value. It's one of the ones that's least threatening to people. And it's the one that's really helped to fuel the interactive experiences we create and let our industry grow from being a medium that's a niche hobby into like one of the most impactful today. But it's never been the only one. I mean, we've, we've always, to some extent, thought about authenticity and fidelity when we think about the models of the worlds we're creating. We think about connection, how we interact with other people, how when you think about the strategies employed by companies to help players develop a passion, not just for the characters in the game, but the greater worlds are set in or the adventures they have with one another, there's community and there's edification. Like how do you make stories that actually impact people? Stories that can change minds and hearts that goes beyond one play session. I mean, the goal, because when we're developing games, our goal is not necessarily just to make something that people play once and go, eh, that was fun and then walk on. That, there's no point in that, really. You want to make something that leaves an impact on people. Whether you're a serious game developer trying to create something that people learn from in terms of specialized knowledge, you're someone creating a more entertainment-focused game. People have to learn things like, say, the mechanics, or how characters work together, or bits of specialized knowledge to help them on to the next, uh, like the next, um, Thing in real life. But values aren't everything. Because when you're talking because when you're talking about things like serious games, 
this is where you have to also deal with the disciplines things are working in. And when you combine the values and the disciplines, then you come up with an interesting uh, array of possibilities. Like defense games are going to be a certain way versus health games are going to be a certain other way versus entertainment games are going to be a certain other other way based on the values imposed by the discipline and the standards they have. You have different differing needs by the revenue models. If you're working with client-based games, if you're taking client work, that's going to be very different than if you're going trying to sell the games in a commercial market. And there may be problems if you're trying to sell games in the commercial market, if you're talking on serious topics because of censorship, free speech, regulations, and such. There are differing needs by field because different people have different expectations. Differing needs by platform. You design for a mobile platform, that's not going to be the same as a PC or a console. And of course, there are all those wonderful things like regional differences, language being only one of them. UI is another. Which way do people look when they uh, look across the screen? Do they scan from right to left or left to right? What do colors mean to people? Sometimes if you're using red for stop and green for go, this doesn't work as well in Asia, for example, where red is considered a good color. So you want to make sure that red is okay and green is canceled, which doesn't always intuitively make sense to us in the West. So are there communities or so? When they talk about community for serious play, are there communities for serious games? Uh, the answer is yes. There's a lot of little communities, or not so little communities. I mean, you have my little IGD serious games sig, but you also have things like Games for Change, one of the biggest conferences known for this stuff. You have GDC, which used to host the Serious Games Summit. You have the Serious Games Network. You have Rage, interesting name that. You have ITSEC, a name that gets thrown around a lot. It's probably the biggest serious games conference in the world, <sighs> run by the defense industry. You have the Serious Play Conference, Institute of Play, Serious Games Association, and this little association I helped, but I helped with the uh, Serious Games Australia New Zealand. So they have a whole little network trying to unify all the serious game devs in their little corner of the world. And and all those are interesting. All those are necessary to what they do, but. If we go back to the strong tie, weak tie theory, each of these are pretty much an example of a collection of strong ties. You have a certain group of people that goes to each one of these, as opposed to, and most of those don't necessarily cross over between them. So, what you, so when you have a lot of people going to each one of these, but not necessarily to multiple, what, you mean, what happens is that knowledge gets siloed. Knowledge gets, the knowledge built up in each of these communities gets trapped in these little communities. So people who go to these games for change can become away thinking, oh, these are really interesting games that are being made, where people coming from EdSec, thinking about the defense games, games for health, thinking about the health games. And GDC, most people don't think about serious games at all, even though a lot of games they do use these days actually involve a lot of serious play. So this because you, so this decreases the diversity of thought and increases the divisions between devs of serious games, and devs of commercial games, because you don't hear stuff being talked about very much. Sometimes in the serious game conferences, you hear talk that, oh, you're selling games for money, therefore it's not, therefore like you're not really making a serious game. Things terms become more specific, more exclusive. And this doesn't actually help when you're trying to build an international community. What you need are more weak ties, more people that can bridge the gaps and go between the various communities so you have knowledge sharing. But that's, that's very difficult. And yet even despite that, it's interesting to see how companies are exploring values beyond fun in their games today. If you take a look at the financial some of them are doing this for financial reasons. Some of them are looking for greater authenticity. I mean, if you think about Ubisoft, they have a franchise historian that actually goes and tries to make sure everything is accurate to history in terms of at least the settings and such. The actual story, maybe not so much. And they, have pe and they all have community managers because this is necessary to keep people around for a, a while. Games explore aspects of the world. They share, they shed light on those who play them and those, and also those who develop them. I mean, let's take a look at a few examples of some of these things. I'm, so uh, a show of hands, how many of these do people recognize one of them? 
Two? Three? All four. Okay. Bit of a spread there. Uh, games here are Journey, which came out in 2012. Uh, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice talked a little bit about mental mental health, specifically uh, dementia, schizophrenia, dissociative identity disorder. You have Project Discovery and EVE Online, which is uh, using citizen science in large scale, in large scale MMO. It first out with the Human Protein Atlas to help people saw how people solve cellular structures and now they're actually looking for exoplanets which is very thematically appropriate and then you have the discovery tour mode in uh, assassin's creed ancient egypt where in that mode instead of going around killing people you're going around and like you're looking at the various things in the context of history so there's a lot of histor there's a lot of serious play that goes on even in games that are meant for the commercial industry, these things. Yet, they're not generally called serious games, because if they were, most people wouldn't buy them. The question really is then, if we have this sort of serious play going on in this community, and if we have a lot of people in the serious games community who are looking for more lessons for how do we distribute to people, because this has traditionally been a problem. How do we learn to market? How do we learn different things? Maybe it's time we start looking for ways to look past the divisions between uh, commercial and serious games and work on a community that supports serious play, no matter the form of the game that it comes in. Harder said than done, but easier said than done, but yeah. I mean, we talk about how serious games before are games designed for primary purpose other than pure entertainment, but I propose that maybe we could talk about serious games as games designed with a purpose, a purpose other than pure entertainment, that maybe it doesn't have to necessarily be the primary purpose. Or hell, why don't we just use a different term altogether? Why don't we just go with serious play, not serious games? Because play is something you do, not as opposed to a serious game, which is a concrete thing. And if you create a community for serious play, that's a lot more welcoming, a lot more inclusive than working to try to create a community for serious games. Because everyone has their own idea what serious games are, the percentage of seriousness as opposed to entertainment you need, the exact mechanics, the way of distribution. So let's get past that. Let's go focus on what really matters, the fact that we're working on serious play. We're trying to talk about things that go beyond entertainment. I don't mean that we need another serious game conference or a serious play conference. There is a serious play conference. There are lots of conferences all over the world that cover all sorts of topics, but they're all discipline specific, like I said, and very few are inclusive of the larger industry. And if you talk about the large uh, organizations like large organizations that exist, you have regional and you have national organizations, but most of them propose, just promote the cause of serious games and work with developers in the area. There's not a lot of outreach to new people. There's not a lot of cross association or organization collaboration. There's not a lot of learning from the larger industries and the lessons they hold. And Really, there's not a lot of attempt to get into the events like PAX, GDC, GCAP, in order to make sure that people are not just echoing what we've already learned, but are sharing the lessons that we sharing lessons that we've learned across industries and across different groups. Serious game uh, GDC used to have the Serious Game Summit a few years ago. I'm working on trying to get that back because. GDC is the single largest grouping of game de developers around the world when everyone comes together for that weekend. And it would be nice to have something besides the one little round table that gives people a sense of feel connected. This, uh, pers personally speaking, that round table always runs over anyway. We were given half an hour, it tends to go for more than like one or two until we actually get kicked out of the room because people always have a lot to say and there's not enough time to say it in. So some of the specific lessons, I guess. We have to build a culture collaboration. We have to weave serious play into the culture of the industry as a whole. But how do we do this? Because right now, serious play is not necessarily part of the culture, even if things that can be called serious play are part of all the, most of the games we make. Well, like anything else, it starts with education. 
Like when we talk about how we teach people to make games, a lot of times we talk about three primary roles, artist, programmer, designer. Okay, sometimes producer because project management is important too. And if you let the designers go, they will run away with things and, try and won't find a good stopping point. We also need to promote a greater collaboration with uh, other fields early in game development. We need to show people that there are possibilities for roles in games other than the, this trinity and the producer role. That say, econo economists can be useful, that healthcare people can be useful, and expose people to what different fields can offer and the knowledge in these other fields. Because we don't want to perpetuate the games versus serious games divide that some groups are doing. So I don't mean that we need to have game programs that just teach people how to make serious games. A few schools, a few schools have gone that way. I'm not sure I agree that's the right approach. What I think is we need to take some of the serious play elements and integrate them into the standard game, edu game uh, development curriculum to make sure that when people are creating games, they know about other possibilities, other markets, and are more equipped to like, work with these different groups in the future. The second group is, uh, the second building block is, I guess, is cross-pollination, making sure the serious play gets discussed at general industry conferences. This can take the form of getting a track or a summit for things, like a GDC or GCAP, which is Game Connect Asia Pacific down in Australia, which is starting a track for that, uh, which is nice. Or highlighting the roles of other professions in the creative process, like the historian or the economist, the people who work really hard to make sure that your gaming economies don't break in online games. Not just your designers and your programmers and such. And then, of course, collaborations with other groups, whichever they may be, whether it's within the IGDA with various uh, SIGs or cross-collaborations between companies and large-scale organizations in health. Making sure we go to game jams sponsored by different things, making sure we're always going out looking for new things that can help inform our design and going out and sharing what we know with the world. I think it's the third one's publicity. Because serious play really needs to be written about more outside of just academic journals and the occasional newspaper that comes out every once in a while. Because if all people are hearing about serious play or games in general are either, hey, games cause violence, a thing that was debunked years ago at this point, or that, oh, this is a miracle game that really will help to like revolutionize the world about mental health, these narratives are both, one, clashing, and two, they're not a really good picture of what games can actually do. So when you have people in, say, academia who are interested in using, seria, using games for serious purposes, a lot of them expect miracles. And miracles are not what we can deliver most of the time. Games are a long, making games is a long, hard process. And more transparency about that and what they can do for people the engagement they can provide, the mechanisms through which this can be offered, it, that would be really powerful. We need, another thing is openly exploring the financial and community benefits of serious play. How in our industries, serious things like how the, the way we build communities, the way we leverage groups, the way that we use narratives, interactive and otherwise, really draw people in and what they teach people. If we explored more of that, gave a little more emphasis to those teams and all, and all the things that people can actually learn from even our entertainment-based games, and how some of them are celebrations of uh, lore from a certain part of the world or such, like, so for example, The Witcher, which is really based in like Polish lore, I think that could really be interesting. As opposed to people th just talking about, oh, games is entertainment, games is fun, games are not games need to be discussed as another medium on par with film or books or anything else. Because it really troubles me when people say that, oh, how dare people make a game about this? Like, as if a game is something trivial. A game is, some, a game is something less than the other media. And of course, we need to be able to highlight and showcase how commercial games are being used for serious purposes. I showed a few examples before, but there are others. like. Portal 2, for instance, has been used to teach physics. It's a good thing for that. And there are a few others around the world. Uh, the Age of Empires series has been really good with bundling knowledge in there. So when people are interested in, in building new civilizations, there's all that tangential learning going on. 
Like, oh, why, why is this unit so difficult to kill? Why, why does this thing look like it has armored? And turns out, oh wait, there actually was an armored ship called a turtle ship that was really good at keeping people from boarding when, all those years ago. How do you get a kid to learn that? There's some other way except getting interested through play. Because it's easy to try to force knowledge to people, but it's much harder to make them want to learn. Games are good at that. So we've talked about that, so on and so on and so on. Why? Because we're at a crossroads for serious play, where it could go one of a few different ways. We could become more notable, or we could continue to build our little closed off communities and really just fall into obscurity a lot of the time with a lot of the traditional serious game groups being completely separate from the industry groups. I mean, serious games right now do make up a substantial portion of the industry, about if the industry is like $85 billion, the serious games, in this, the serious games is a few billion in of itself, so it has, it has a good percentage of revenue, it's just not talked about. We need to like get rid of the stigma around the term because that will honestly probably help to deal with the stigma around games in general anyway. If people stop thinking that games are just trivial and that games contribute to poor outcomes. If people learn that games can do more outside of our industry, I think that different groups will be more accepting of games and the possibilities they offer. The trouble is it requires more than yeah, conferences or organizations. It requires rethinking what we see as communities and our roles as part of the discipline in the industry. It requires thinking about who are we? We're a lot of different things. Some of us make, some of us are developers, some of us call ourselves artists, storytellers, players, game designers, teachers, historians, scientists, scholars, creators. But I'd like to go back to this old quote by Hutzinga in uh, Homo Ludens, where he talks about how all play works within this playground marked off beforehand and how they are temporary worlds dedicated to the performance of an act. And so what I think is that we build worlds and that we shape reality. And if we can do that, if we can create these experiences that are not just fun, but meaningful, if we can create opportunities that uh, help people learn and grow and breathe life into characters and worlds, why can't we do that for our own industry and, and cross the divisions that we've built up, the walls that we've developed over time? Why can't we create a better culture, a better community, a better world for serious play? Thank you. I will take questions if anyone has them. Yes, Tom. The mic doesn't seem to be working. It has part. Oh, there we go. Ah. Uh, so uh, thanks for that. That was uh, very informative. I have a question. Do you think we, because we talked about uh, serious games or serious play in the sense of uh, academic and, and in the health sector and all of that, do you think that we can include uh, something like office gamification and, and B2B gamification basically for companies into this sort of group name or do you think that will just piss off people? <laughs> uh I mean, I think there are a lot of people in serious games who get irked by the notion of gamification, just there are, there are a lot of game designers who get irked by it. But that's a lot of times that's because the term gamification gets used for really shallow applications, where you take things like points and levels, all the things that really don't mean all that much in the grand scheme of things, and people apply them and think that, oh, these are just, this is the essence of games, which is not true at all. I think. I think that if we were to delve into what makes games games and be able to better spread this across different communities, that if we were actually working with long term um, gamification on a meaningful and deeper level, we could really start to pull out more interesting mechanics that keep people around for longer. So sort of like social studies, but in a company setting in this case. Yeah. Uh, I have a second question. Uh -huh. um, do you, don't you think that 
maybe because because you mentioned that some games have these aspects to them already which are uh -huh. serious right yes i think you mentioned uh, witcher in general yes um i mean of course we have that in media as well star trek for example tackled yes. with a lot of mm -hmm. you know back then uh, issues don't you think that's the sort of better way of approaching people rather than making you know setting out to make a specific game about we need to highlight this or, 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 or make sure that they know about this, etc. So I like sneak it in rather than preach to people is what I'm saying. I think there's a role for both. I think that for general awareness, uh, sneaking it in is definitely the better approach. That if you want to make sure people ha are exposed to an issue, yeah, sneak it in, put it into a popular media like The Witcher, like Age of Empires, like one of these other big games where you have lots and lots of people playing it. But I also feel that there is a role sometimes for specific audiences if you're custom designing a game. I mean, like anything else, it really depends on who you're making the game for, what you're trying to address, and in what way. Thank you. Anyone else? I guess that's it. Then let's give a round of warm okay. applause to Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs>